All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation, special edition of Knicks Fan TV presented by Manscaped. This is the season debrief, and we're going to look ahead into the Knicks offseason. And joining me today is special guest. He covers the Knicks for The Athletic, and that is Fred Katz. Fred, how are you doing today, man? Thanks for joining. All right. I am great. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. I, I appreciated your articles and your insight this year. You did a really good job. Um, first year covering the Knicks on the beat, previously with the Washington Wizards. How do you reflect back on your first year? It was great. You know, I'm a, I'm a native of New Yorker. I grew up in New York City, so it was honestly just, I love D.C. I loved living in D.C. I would have stayed in D.C. longer, but it was it was really nice to be home. And, uh, you know, obviously it's a, it's a, uh, thirsty fan base for coverage so uh i don't think adding an extra voice or i should say replacing mike Vorkanov as an extra voice is uh i don't think it makes the beat too crowded at all i think they're if you write about the knicks man people are going to read about it so it was it was great it was great it was really fun yeah mike left a huge void but i felt like you stepped in and, and did a great job man now how would you is is there a, a comparison between you know, your reactions and, and your engagement with Wizards fans as compared to Knicks fans based on, you know, some of your work this year? Yeah, I mean, no question. I mean, look, they, there's a sect of the Wizards fan base that is very passionate. But overall, that fan base is just, I would say, there's a level of, of just kind of general depression in the Wizards <laughs> fan base, which I think even Knicks fans don't understand. Like, yeah, I think yeah. Knicks fans are more angry. And Wizards fans are just kind of just like like Knicks fans are out protesting while Wizards fans are sitting on their couch <laughs> eating potato <laughs> chips to try to forget. You know what I mean? That's yeah. kind of the different levels of of just bad places that they're at. Yeah, I think the big difference is Knicks fans for for as 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 torturous at times, I'm sure, as the last 20 years has been. The Knicks have actually had legitimately good teams yeah. in the last 40 years, like even since the titles, you, know, you had the 90s teams mm -hmm, reviewing mm -hmm. and that were really, really good. Mm -hmm. You had the the one mellow team in 13 that was that was really good. The you know the last time the Wizards won 50 games. Did did Wall do it? 1979. Whoa, whoa. It's the longest streak in the NBA. Wow. And I'm a huge believer, especially after covering the Wizards, that the best way to lose fans is not necessarily be bad for a long time. It's to just never be great yeah, because people yeah. don't really jump on the bandwagon of a 46 win team that yeah. it might happen, but the real casual fans aren't jumping on the bandwagon of a 46 win team. And unless it's like an especially exciting team, you're just, you're not inspiring a fan base with a 46 win season over the long term. You're not yeah. making lifelong fans out of that. But you might after out of a 55 win team. Yeah. And the Wizards just never have that. They won 49 in 2017. It was their best wow. team since 1979. Uh, and and they've they've obviously fallen off since then. And it's just I think that shows amongst many other things. I think that shows in in the fan base. And uh, it's unfortunate because Washington is a is a great is a great city. Yeah. And honestly, like from a, like they have a good high school hoops down. Like, yeah, there are a yeah. lot of great players. PG County, from, all of that. Yeah, yep, hundred percent. Like that's where KD's from. Right, from right. PG County. Like there are a lot of great players who come out of there. A lot of great players who come out of Baltimore. Yeah. Uh. So, so it's uh, like there's there's something there, but it just doesn't translate to the NBA team. Does doesn't translate to the professional level, man. But uh, you know, as a Knicks fan, I, I think that, you know we sometimes we we can. Uh, we can relish in that pain, similar to 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 how the the Wizards fan does, man. You know, I, I want to touch on on some topics that um some of the key storylines of this season, and in terms of the debates amongst the fans, and and how polarizing we can be. And it starts with Tibbs. You know, it starts with Tom Thibodeau, NBA Coach of the Year last year. This year, a good portion of the fan base wants him gone. <laughs> you know, the lack of in game adjustments. You know, late game execution. Player development. This guy's not playing. He's not playing this guy and so on and so forth. How did you evaluate Tom Thibodeau's job this year? So I think what's really interesting about Tibbs, and it's it's the reason why he's so polarizing, is because the stuff he does, he does well, he does really well. And the stuff he doesn't do well is so unbelievably obvious. 
it's it's almost a little uh you know, I, I before I covered the Wizards, I covered the Thunder. Mm. And it's almost a little Westbrookian. Mm. You know, where where you get the stuff he does well, it's like this guy might be the best rebounding guard to ever step on a basketball court. And then the the wild Westbrook type decision making, you're like, you just kind of have to live with it. And I think it's hard to grapple with that sort of nuance. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and sometimes the the great parts can overpower the bad parts. Sometimes the bad parts can overpower the great parts. Uh, I did write a story last week on Tibbs's player development. I, I think that is probably the one thing where I go against the grain the most when it comes to Tibbs. I think the young guys have developed quite nicely. Mm-hmm. I think if you look at Emmanuel quickly, I think he's better now than he was at the beginning of the year. I think if you look at Obi Toppin, I think he's better now than he was at the beginning of the year. And I think if you look at RJ Barrett, same thing, Quentin Grimes. I mean, he, he, he looks like he's really going to be a player Jericho Sims for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, you look at these guys and they are getting better under Tibbs. I don't know how much of that, has to do specifically with Tibbs and how much of it has to do specifically with each individual. But I think it's fair to say that some of that goes on the coaching staff and most of it goes to the player. But at the very least, the coaching staff is not necessarily holding these guys back. Player development and how he deploys these guys in games are different conversations in my mind. Uh, They're they're different things. I'm not disagreeing with Obi Toppin could have played more this year. I'm not disagreeing with Emmanuel quickly could have started the last seven games of the season. Mm. To me, they're just, they're different topics. To me, the the biggest issue with Tibbs was um, you saw times throughout the year where he and the front office weren't on the same page, or maybe yeah. he, even he and players weren't on the same page. Cam Reddish trade is a really obvious example. Uh, the time when Kemba Walker said that Tibbs didn't talk to him about uh, benching him that mm. first time he got benched, I thought that was a really bad look when Kemba mm-hmm. brought that up and he yeah, just brought that definitely. up in a press conference on the record. I don't think you need to bring up every time you bench a player. I understand that. But if anyone has earned that from both a right. accolades perspective and a character perspective, it's Kemba Walker. Uh, so I thought that was a bad look. And, 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 and the, the late game offense stuff is, is for sure is for sure something that, that needs to be looked at with the way that it's just kind of like brush green for Julius Randall head to the high post 18 feet isolation for Randall, maybe Mm -hmm. a post up. And and it's just kind of that over and over. Um, I'm, I'm less sympathetic to starting Alec Burks all season, (laughs) which I know is another big (laughs) one. I honestly put more blame on the roster construction than I do on Tibbs. Uh, He was handed two point guards who couldn't stay healthy all season. And they didn't get a viable third one. And I'm not arguing Alec Burks was a a viable point guard. I just don't think it's insane for somebody to think that he is the most reliable guy there. Um, So, I mean, I I tend to look at the Tib stuff issue by issue. You know what I mean? I'm sure there are other ones that I didn't bring up. Uh, But I don't know. Is there anything else that you think would have been worth discussing in that in that topic? Look, I, I thought the piece that you wrote, because because I was a guy who this year, I, I drew the eye of the fans this year, because I, like you, thought that this team's struggles this year was more of a front office issue than a coaching issue. I'm a guy who says coaches coach, players play. Yes, there's aspects of the game where the coach is important in terms of his in-game adjustments, in terms of, uh, you know, how he's handling substitution patterns, out of timeouts, you know, strategies and tactics and, and things of that nature. But I also think, you know, it's a roster issue. And, and we're going to get to Julius in a second. But to me, if the head of the snake is rotten, <laughs> you're not going to have a very good team. And so... I, I think that's definitely yeah. true. Yeah. I and, agree with you. And I just felt like, you know, the fans' take on Tibbs was just so black and white that they were kind of missing, you know, the in-between. And that, and that's why I liked your piece that came out because it, it wasn't something, I didn't take it as something where, you know, I would say, see, I told you so, you know, Tibbs is great or Tibbs is, you know, all in on play development. But I think it was something important for the fans to see a behind the scenes look at his investment in these young players, you know, having a completely separate practice just for them, running through offensive sets, 
I also think, as you said, a lot of these young players, we saw improvements. We see RJ improving from year two to three again. Uh, Obi Toppin, yes, it was as a result of Julius not playing, and we're going to get to that in a second. Quentin Grimes, I thought, showed a lot of flashes. Jericho Sims got a big opportunity after the trade deadline. You know, he became the, the, the default backup center. I thought these guys took leaps. And a lot of the fan base will say, oh, they did that on their own. They did that on their own. But, you know, in a case of a quickly, I saw a kid who he got his 20 minutes per game as a rookie. He came in situationally. He came out when the coach felt like he was overmatched. This year, I saw them invested in him as a point guard option. But a guy that, you know, Tibbs relied on to close games. And we saw quickly's growth as a playmaker, as the leader of that second unit, kind of taking over for Rose to a certain extent. So I think you got to give Tibbs some credit there in in terms of player development. I mean, I think the other side of it is... Okay, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. How many guys who receive regular minutes for the Knicks this year would you say are legitimately plus defenders? (sighs) Mitchell Robinson. Mitch, (laughs) yeah. How how many else are legitimately plus defenders? RJ, Look, I, RJ Wayne. I think, yeah, RJ took a little bit of a step back. I thought last he's year not, it was better. He's not a plus. Yeah. He's not a legitimately plus defender. Yeah. At, at least in the nice... starting five, you don't, you don't have that. You right. know, I think Quickly's defense has improved off the bench. Yeah, still gambles too much, though. Yeah. Still not, still not strong. Gets muscled. Right. Not a legitimately plus defender. So, right. so we're going through it. Taj Gibson. He's a good defender. Can be. I, I don't think Taj, Taj matches up with the, the true centers out there, but I think he still brings that, you know, that no, veteran not, savvy. And, he's not Rudy Gobert, right, but he's right. a, he's, he is a phenomenal positional defender. Yeah. Uh, and has randomly become a good shot blocker at 36. When a, a story that I never wrote this year is that, yeah. like, Taj Gibson has randomly just started having 5% block rates every year. Wow. Which means he just blocks one in 22 pointers when yeah. he's on the floor, which is like a really, really good number. And he was never a shot blocker. Yeah, right. Before. He was never a shot blocker. Yeah. So I just, I, I find this amazing that in his mid 30s, he's like, I think I'm going to stop blocking shots mm. or start blocking shots. Anyway, we just went through the roster. We watch every single Knicks game. Yeah. And we just named two guys who are legitimate plus defenders who who received consistent minutes this season. If you want to include Quentin Grimes, okay, fine. Uh, Quentin Grimes is good. They finished 11th in defense. For for all the talk of um, the kind of the rigidity of Tibbs' schemes, and there's no question that that is true. I'm not disagreeing with the facts behind that statement. But I do think there is another side to that rigidity which is that in the regular season, defense can be as much about muscle memory and positioning as it is about anything else. And when you have that rigidity, there's another way to look at rigidity, and it's stability. I know every time I go here, that guy is supposed to go there because that is what we do. And you know what? Those were the concepts that worked pretty wonderfully for them when they got the four seed last season. Uh, This past season... They got off to a really bad start defensively mm-hmm. by their standards, in part because teams were just destroying them from three. Yeah, I think they shored some stuff up, uh, but they played a lot of the season with like seriously weak links at different positions. Kemba, uh, Fournier, mm-hmm. although I do think Fournier is a little better defensively than his reputation because he can be handsy. And, mm-hmm. he, and he plays hard. It's not an effort thing with him. Like he, he definitely tries. Uh, <laughs> And he'll just he'll just get beat because he has physical limitations on that end. Right. But but like they didn't have Nerlens Noel for basically the entire season after he was so important to them two years ago. And they finished eleventh in defense. Yeah. I mean, I think that that is another Tibbs positive. Like it's not BS that Tibbs is t- you get Tibbs and he is going to make sure, unless something crazy happens, there were some bad defensive teams in Minnesota, but that was just, there were weird personality fits there. Like, if you have guys who buy in, and these guys did buy in, then you'll be good defensively. You're, you're mm-hmm. going to max out your defensive personnel. Like, I don't, I can't look at this roster and say they should have been better than 11th in defense. I can look at it and say they should have been better than 25th in offense, but I, I can't look at it and say they should have been better than 11th in defense. 
Yeah, no question. And and it was very apparent, especially in the second half. You know, they really showed some bright spots, especially on the defensive end and, and strung some good games together. And then to me, that just speaks to, as you said, um, a unit that's still bought in despite the the lack of success, despite the ups and downs. And I think that can be attributed to to the work of the coach and, and the discipline of the coach, the work that he puts in to, to get his team prepared. Um, offensively, I think it's still left a lot to be desired. You know, second year in a row, offense hasn't been there. Finished about 22nd in offense. Once again, last in cutting. Not a lot of off-ball movement. Uh, a lot of stagnation on that offense. A lot of the fans have said, you know, we need an offensive coordinator. We, we, need, we need an offensive guy on that side of the ball. What do you think of, of the makeup of the coaching staff and, and how they implement um, these schemes from an offensive standpoint? I think there's a... I would imagine there's a pretty good chance they bring in another high up assisting because two years ago they lose Mike Woodson. Mm. And then this past year they lose Kenny Payne mm. and they never replaced Woodson. So, so I imagine they're going to bring in somebody else to just bring in more experience. Mm. I don't know who that's going to end up being, but I, I would be surprised if they didn't bring in at least another guy just to add some more experience to that assistant coaching staff and, mm. and, and bring in another voice. I, I, I think that's something that they'll do uh, in terms of just, I don't know. I don't think that like an offensive coordinator situation is possible with Tibbs, to be honest. Mm. I think, I think when he's your coach, he's your coach and, and you just kind of live with those situations. Uh, and I, 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 that's, that's my personal opinion. Maybe it evolves. Like mm. part of my story was about the evolution of Tibbs from what he was 10 years ago, how, you know, I have a quote in there from that you, the story you referenced, I'm saying, mm-hmm. uh, I have a quote in there from Taj Gibson where, where Taj and Taj was with Tibbs year one in Chicago and he was with Tibbs in Minnesota and he's with Tibbs now. And Taj said in, in, in that quote that, you know, when he first came, the biggest difference is that when he first came to Chicago, mm-hmm. he didn't really talk to or work with the young guys. And now he does it so enthusiastically uh, and he used specifically Taj used uh, Tibbs's relationship with Emmanuel quickly mm. as something that he deemed special and, and particular to this and, and just how much he enjoys coaching quickly. And, and that story was about kind of the practices that Tibbs now holds specifically for the young guys, as you mentioned, that's a way that he's evolved. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm going off an older representation of Tibbs, uh, but, but at least my guess from people who've worked with Tibbs in the past is that, you know, when Tibbs is your coach, he is your coach. He's the one who is going to be the decision maker. So I don't think like a sort of I'm handing the offense over to you Mm. sort of thing is, is particularly viable. Like, like I don't see Alvin Gentry coming Mm. and being like, I'm, we're going to run the Alvin Gentry system. I just, I don't see that. I think the greatest hope would be, they run some sort of stuff where they can just get more movement on the weak side. Like you mentioned the cutting, it's not quite there. Uh, I also think things will look a lot better if they just have someone to get them into their offense. Cause no matter what you think of Julius Randall, if you think that what he had this past season was what he did this past season was so bad that he's never going to recover it. And this is, the player that he will always be, he will just be a, a, a detrimental player. Or you think this past season was so difficult and he's actually the guy he was when he won most improved two years ago. And that's what he's going to return to. No matter what you think, Julius Randle is a guy who can create once you're already into your offense. Right. He's not the guy who gets you into your offense. The majority of the time, he can do it every once in a while. He can do it the right situations. Yeah. He can push on the break. But for 48 minutes, he's not the guy who is bringing up the ball and legitimately running point. He's a he's a power forward. They need someone to just get them into their offense. Big they have the slowest offense in the league this year. And that, to me, is more a personnel thing yeah. than a Tibbs thing. That's Alec Burks is bringing the ball up. Mm-hmm. I wrote a story two months ago, and I can check to see how the numbers progress. But I wrote a story two months ago where I got a hold of some second spectrum numbers where like Alec Burks was one of 87 players or something like that who who had brought the ball up the floor 500 or more times this season. And when he brought the ball up the floor, the Knicks had the 87th fastest offense. <laughs> they, they were literally dead last when Alec Burks brought the floor up in terms of 
they were taking like 19 point something seconds on possessions that Alec Burks brought the ball up. That means their average possession when Alec Burks brought the ball up, they were taking a shot with four seconds left on the shot clock. Like that's, that's just not what you, that's not what good offense looks like. You know, with each second that comes off the shot clock, your offensive efficiency is going to get a little bit worse. And I mean, they're they're, Seth part now, my colleague at the athletic Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. has, has written about that. Mm -hmm. And, and if they just have someone who can run a pick and roll with 16 on the clock, clock shot clock as the first action, instead of someone who runs a pick and roll with 11 on the shot clock as a first action, those five seconds are so important because what happens is if the defense thwarts that pick and roll, now you can run a second action. Right. right. And yeah. the Knicks never have opportunities to run second actions. First one fails. All right. We got an ISO with six seconds left on the clock. Yeah. And that's part of why their offense was as low ranked as it was. So I just think part of it is just like you get an architect in there and he can he can design a little something for you on the spot. Uh, I, I honestly think that the most important thing is as simple as that. Which is why I'm I'm still puzzled as to why they never gave quickly that chance. Because every time he came in, he is the lightning rod. He was the guy that pushes him, gets him into their offense very fast, the speeds up the pace. He's always looking to push, always looking to push. And we, we still haven't gotten that larger sample size of, of quickly RJ Randall as a unit. You know, I get, you know, with Rose out quickly kind of running that show and then closing. I get that. But with the offense, with the starting unit being so, you know, poor in terms of getting into their offense and, and being a bad first quarter team, I just wonder why they never gave quickly that that opportunity when the whole Kemba thing was spiraling out of control. Yeah, I think that's fair. And it's not just an Alec Burks thing. Like, they were slow as hell when Kemba got them into their offense. Like mm-hmm. Kemba mm-hmm. Would, would jog it up the floor, would dribble at the top of the key, and then he'd run a pick and roll with 12 seconds left on the clock. Mm-hmm. We saw it time and time again. I, I agree. To me, that's the greatest argument for why Emmanuel quickly should have played more with the first unit. Just his his speed, like his, yeah. his ability to get the ball at the floor, create easier buckets and, and and people here playing fast. And they think that means like Obi Toppin on the fast break. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it does, mm-hmm. but playing fast can also mean playing fast in the half court. If everybody Absolutely. rushes down the floor and you get into your offense with 16 seconds, well, you know what? Even if you end up getting into a late clock isolation with six on the shot clock, you are more likely that that is against somebody who is not supposed to be guarding you. Yeah. Because when you rush down the floor, the defense has to rush That's down right. the floor right. and they might have to pick up someone they're not, they're not supposed to be on. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's just things are so much easier when you get down the floor quickly. And, 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 and part of it is just like you just have to do it. But the other part of it is you have to have people who are comfortable doing it mm-hmm. and like. Obi Toppin is comfortable doing it, yep. but he's not going to dribble the ball down the floor. Right. He's just going to spring all the way down to the other side and hope that everybody follows him. And that's kind of all he can do. And you're right. Like quickly will do that. I think part of quickly not really getting that first unit time was just like, it's easy to forget. Like he had a month and a half stretch. He basically had two really yeah. extended, really bad. Slides. Yeah, he did. He did. And mm. And in the winter, it was like January into mid-February. He had a month and a half long stretch where he shot 26%. Yeah. I know the on-offs on him are the best on the team. Mm -hmm. They're excellent. They were like 13 points per 100 better when Mm -hmm. he was on the Mm -hmm. floor. And I think the eye test backs up those numbers. But, like, it's hard to justify when a guy is shooting 26% over an extended period. Like, you know what? We're throwing him in the starting lineup. Yeah. So I, I agree. And I wrote at the end of the season, like they got to be starting quickly at this point, but that should be in the conversation too. Cause like, that's a thing that happened. When you, when you look at the head of the snake is Julius Randle, you know, all the accolades from last year, all NBA honors and, and most improved all-star, the step in third, it's been a train wreck and the shooting numbers have come back. I think he's in the fourth percentile and effective field goal percentage. Uh, the turnovers, we, we, we saw the the outbursts uh, against the fans. When you look at the Knicks regression this year, I think it was the one thing that you feared was obviously going to was going to start with Julius Randle. Um, how do they get this guy back on track? 
I think part of it is making his job easier. Like he has a difficult job. The Knicks had really crunched floor spacing this year, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. uh, especially because like Mitchell Robinson's always around the rim. And, and yeah. there were a lot of times, like when, when Julius Randle's on the floor without a conventional center, he actually does go at the rim and the numbers back that up. Yeah. When he's on the floor next to Mitchell Robinson or Jericho Sims or Taj Gibson or Nerlens Noel, that's when he becomes more jump shot reliant. I think Julius Randle can go back to being a, a, a good, helpful winning player, even if the jump shot never looks close to what it was last year. I mean, I think it's, it's plausible, if not likely, that the 2020-21 season that he had when he won MIP and made All-NBA, mm-hmm. that that's just going to be the best shooting season he ever had. He shot over 40 from three, and the mid-range numbers were excellent. And he's just never come close to putting up those numbers before. And I think there's a good chance that those are going to be the best shooting numbers he ever had. But it's not like when he was in New Orleans or something in that in that one year he was in New Orleans that he was a bad player. He was a good player. Yeah, you play well. He just he just wasn't a shooter. Right. He, he was he would get downhill relentlessly. He was a bowling ball, mm-hmm. and he's still capable of doing that. He actually shot like really poorly around the rim this year. Yeah, too. he did. He did. He shot really poorly around the rim. So I think if he can if he can recover that somehow, and if the Knicks just from a lineup construction can make his job easier. And and I don't know, maybe maybe that means finding somebody a center who fits better alongside him than Mitchell Robinson. I think that's why like Miles Turner is a very intuitive fit for them, X's nose wide, mm-hmm. because he he quenches Tibbs's thirst for a rim protector. Right. And quenches Randall's first for thirst for somebody who opponents are actually going to guard at the three point line. Uh, and, and he opens up the floor some more and it's not just for Randall too, because RJ is better inside the three point yeah. line as well. Even if RJ gets a better three point shot, he's still better inside the three point line. That's, that's his identity. And, and it's more about geography than skill set when it comes to spacing. It's, it's where are guys going to be physically then, then where does their, where is their skill set good? Uh, or if they can shoot threes. And so I'm a, I'm really curious to see what they do from a roster construction standpoint, because I think that's a way they can really help him, you know? And then like the head stuff, I honestly don't know. I, I, I don't know. Maybe it just goes away. New season goes away. He was obviously all, all the extracurriculars and stuff. Like they were great two years ago. So I don't know. What, what are your theories? I, like I said, to me, this is a Leon issue more so than a Tibbs issue. Uh, and the Knicks front office, you know, his first year here, it, it's, this wasn't Leon Rose, Scott Perry was here. But I just feel like, yes, roster composition. I don't feel like, that. you know, we still haven't built a, a fully cohesive starting unit. Um, I don't think that they help him by getting him good shots. And I think that's a point guard problem. I think for, for a guy that takes as many jumpers as he does, I don't feel like we get him enough in rhythm. You know, he's not Kevin Durant. He, he's not uh, Jason Tatum. He, he's not any of these guys that can just pull up on you at will, at, at will. Last year, he did a much better job at that. He was off the charts at that. But I think overall, uh, we're not getting him easier shots. He, he doesn't have a guy that he can really play off of that could get him more as a finisher rather than as an initiator. I think that's where he stumbled a lot this year, was really trying to generate offense for himself as well as others. I think it, it, it's going to be crucial. If he's going to be on this roster, what do you think about uh, the, the future with him? We did see him at, at, at the Mavericks uh, Jazz Game 1 with World Wide West. They were sitting together. Again, a lot of these fans uh, want some changes to get OB in there, but what do you think about the future of, of Julius Randle? That's, that's a really good point about getting him shots and rhythm, by the way. Like that's, mm-hmm. that's big for him because yeah. he's like, he's not an immediate decision maker. He gets the ball and then he thinks, and then he decides, right. okay, I'm going to drive. I'm going to shoot. I'm going to pass. So here's where I'm going to like the game slows down with him. Even when he like screens, he'll like, like, like there were so many plays this year. It, it, it honestly, it killed me. It like my, a little part of my basketball soul would die every time <laughs> it would happen when like he, Alec Burks would run a pick and roll with him. And they would blitz Alec Burks and Burks would just dump it off to Randall and Randall would have a little four on three advantage in the half court where if he just went one dribble to the hoop, like that is the Steph 
Draymond thing that yeah. they have been destroying the league with for a decade. And Randall is a really good passer and he's got a handle and he's big and he'll get fouled all the time if he's got a mismatch going downhill. Yeah. And he could just grab the ball. He could go one dribble downhill and he could have shooters in either corner and he could have a defender there. He could have a cutter maybe depending on how the play develops. And he could have all of these potential options and he could just go to the rim himself and get a layup or a dunk or a foul or whatever. And instead, Burke stumps it off to him. He's at the top of the key and he takes the shot takes and he shot. just stands there and he jab steps a couple of ghosts and then the yeah. defender comes back and recovers onto him. And now he just goes into an ISO and that happens so many times. So just like quick decision-making, finding a way for him to improve his decision-making. I think we talked about how other people can make his job better, but he's got to make his no job question. better too. And if he can't, if he can't shoot, he can't shoot, you know, yeah. that's, I don't believe he intentionally started missing jumpers. I think he just fell back to not being able to, to, to be a top notch shooter. Uh, and so they got to find other ways to compensate for that. And, and one way is with decision-making as for where he could be. I think the favorite is still that he starts next year on the Knicks. Mm -hmm. I, me I mean, look, me too. I don't know what's going to happen, but if we just break down, if we break down this situation, Julius Randall is, has four years left on his deal. It's not as large of a deal as $106 million sounds. That sounds like some sort of crazy number. Mm. Uh, his salary next year is probably not going to be in the 50 highest in the NBA. It's going to be like 51st or 52nd, right, right. depending on deals some other guys get this summer. It's going to be like the 51st or 52nd highest salary in the NBA next mm. year. Mm. That's not, not gonna kill crazy. You. Yeah. They can have Julius Randle and still have room for two super max guys. That's that's basically how like the math breaks down on Randle's deal. Mm -hmm. That's not it's a lot of money. It would change my life. <laughs> yeah. <right>. But it's <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's not it's not as crazy as twenty six million would have been seven years ago before yeah. the cap spike. Uh it's just it's not an out it's like twenty percent of the projected salary cap. Uh, so, so there are ways, there are ways for them to be good by having him there. But that being said, that contract is not looked at as at all something that's a desirable one for other teams to go get. And he's got four years left and, and, and teams don't know what to expect coming off of this year. I think there were a lot of Randall skeptics coming into this season, specifically about his jump shot and whether what he did during his MIP season was, was real as yeah. a jump shooter. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those people who I've spoken to since are just kind of feeling justified. Mm. Like, okay, we're totally correct on, on, on how we evaluated that MIP season. Like mm. now he's got this, this long-term deal. I think the years to be clear is kind of more detrimental to his trade value than the money. Uh, but this is kind of the lowest Julius Randall's trade value is going to be. Yeah. And the reason I'm as confident in saying that as I am is because I don't think there's any way, barring injury, I don't think there is any way that he is going to be worse next year than he was this year. Yeah. And every single day that passes by is a day that that contract is shorter. So I just don't see why the Knicks, unless they feel like this is such an untenable situation that we cannot go through it for one more second, that that having him is such negative value that we just have to get back yeah. to neutral. I, I don't see why the Knicks would want to part with Randall at his lowest point right. when I think they can operate with relative certainty that higher points are going to come. If someone is willing to just absorb Julius Randall's contract this off season, they're probably willing to do it next off season. Um, or unless they make some, maybe they make some huge swing for some big time player and massive roster renovations come and they say, well, Randall doesn't fit anymore. We just have to, you know, Rudy Gobert becomes available and they're like, we really want Rudy Gobert. Julius Randall can't play next to Rudy Gobert. We got to find a way to get off of Randall so that Gobert can actually fit and, and be Rudy Gobert. And this roster can make sense, you know, something like that, yeah, yeah. like maybe that, but that's obviously there's a low percentage chance of something like that happening. So I'm, I'm guessing that the best situation is, is you hold on to him. You try to rehab his value. 
you, you hope that he can be New Orleans Julius Randle. And if that's the case, then that contract is fine. If he yeah. plays like he did in New Orleans, then that contract is fine. Then you have a good player on a reasonable salary, and that, that's okay. You know, I, what I've gathered from his, his time here is that he, he's never been an untouchable player to the Knicks regime, um, but I don't see them selling low either. You know, I, I don't see them selling low. And as you said, he's at his lowest point right now. Although when he signed the contract, I thought it was a good deal. I thought it was a good deal for both sides. The reason why I'm not so sure this is going to be a tenable situation is uh, the stuff between the ears and his relationship with the fans. You know, as I said, as a guy who, who captures that temperature on a nightly basis, the thumbs down thing kind of did him in, Fred. You know, the thumbs down thing did him in. I don't know if you recall, but his wife, you know, went at me and put me at the forefront of, uh, of you know, the, the Knicks fans, you know, resentment towards them and, and blame me for it. And I just feel like, you know, and Julius also admitted it, you know, uh, uh, that it's impacted him, his family, his son and, and whatnot. And I just feel like the way that OB finished this season, I don't see how Julius Randle can make a single mistake on a nightly basis without the fans moaning and groaning. Uh, to me, it's going to be a similar situation when the fans started to get tired of Carmelo and hogging the ball. And every time you'd hold on to the ball, you would hear the boos and the moaning and the groaning. I think it's going to be the same thing with Julius Randle. And the, the way at which this coach has refused to play these guys now two years in a row, I don't see much changing in the third year. He wants a rim protector out there. He doesn't trust either one of them to, to protect at, at, at the five. I don't see these guys coexisting. And I think... The fans are not going to have much patience for Julius Randle uh, starting off early next season. You certainly might be right. I, I mean, if they come back with a similar front court and it and it plays the same way, you are definitely right that the fans will react that way. Yeah. I just don't know that that's going to come into the decision making at the front office. Yeah. I think they're going to try to do what they believe is the best for the long term. I also think that, um, you know, if you end up just kind of giving away if if it might be a situation i'm not on the tra i'm not making trade calls about julius randall i talked to people around the league about it i don't know what an offer would look like for julius randall mm. it might be a situation where somebody says okay you want us to take julius randall like give us two first round picks that that really might be what it is you can't do that if you're the knicks yeah you're, you're holding on to those picks so you can either have young players or to use them as currency mm -hmm. in in a deal that isn't just offloading a large contract. Right. It's a uh, it's 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 bringing in it's somebody bring in who you yeah. want, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. like otherwise you're just back to ground zero and now you're still a sub 500 team and you have fewer desirable pieces. So I just. It's great to say, you know, it's funny. People, people, people kind of phrase this in certain ways. And we do this with every sport, with every kind of player. Oh, they got to trade so and so. They got to trade so and so. Mm -hmm. Okay, for what? Should they trade Julius Randle for another good player? Sure. I, I, I don't know that that's on the table. I think a Julius Randle trade probably looks something like swapping him for another undesirable contract. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I don't know what that deal would be. I don't know what's out there, but there aren't that many teams with cap space. And if you want to just send them into somebody else's space, I think considering the fact that all the teams who have space this summer are all teams that are not in a position to where they would want a Julius Randle type player on that kind of money. You know, it's the Detroits of the world, right, you know, right. like it's those caliber of teams. They don't, they don't want a veteran on a four year, hundred plus million dollar deal. They what want, about, what about want players and, Maybe I don't think Portland's going to operate as a below the cap team though. Mm. Oh that's, right, right, that's right. my well, guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they they can go well below the cap. Yeah, they can they could go well below the cap. My guess is they'll choose not to because mm -hmm. I think I think they're going to want to keep Nurkic's cap holds on the books, mm -hmm. and they also have a twenty point nine million dollar trade it's exception, trade exception yeah. which they yeah. lose if they drop below the uh, the salary cap. So mm -hmm. so I don't think that Portland is going to be a below the cap team. That's 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 just kind of my guess, knowing their cap numbers. Um, and so there just aren't that many teams. Like if Portland were below the cap team, I think that makes sense. Yeah. But, you know, Sac Sacramento already traded for Sabonis. They got their guy. So, 
So that, I mean, I guess like it's like, you know, I don't know what the hell the yeah. Kings are gonna do. Yeah, but who knows? No one Sacramento, sense. right? They did have three, yeah, exactly. three, three point guards. You know, so yeah, who knows? exactly, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and so I just, I don't know what the trade is that you do with Randall that doesn't also bring back something of just kind of equal ire amongst yeah, yeah. Knicks fans. You know, whether it's having to include first round picks or bring back another guy who makes a similar amount of money and, and is disappointed his fan base the same way that Randall has. Mm -hmm. So it's not just like, Oh, you can trade Randall and you can bring back two good young players. Yeah. If you could do that. Great. Yeah. But I, I don't, I don't believe that that would be out there unless, you know, if you can make a trade, a great trade, you should always make the great trade. Yeah. 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 No question. But uh, now to me, it just brings another question. Why this off season is so crucial. How do they handle OB Toppin? This is a kid who they drafted with the eighth pick. When they drafted him, I said they got the college basketball player of the year, great value, great pick. If they're going to trade Julius Randle, that was my take because I didn't see how these guys were going to coexist. We're going into year three now, and the question still remains. And and during that draft, we still needed a point. We still needed a, a, a defensive-minded wing. We still don't have it. You know, we see the splits with Obi Toppin off the bench as a starter. He's a guy who's clearly shown now that he needs more minutes to get into a rhythm, get into a groove, and then he's off to the races. He's also admitted that, you know, when he's getting those short minutes off the bench, he's looking over his shoulder because he, the, the first mistake that he makes, he's out. Julius is back in, and and most of the time, that's going to be the, the order uh, uh, and how things are going to work. How do they handle this with Obi going forward? I honestly don't know the. It's a great question. It's a question that has to be asked. Mm. I, I just honestly don't know the answer. Uh, Tibbs, you're 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 dead on about Tibbs's basketball ethos. Is there needs to be a rim protector out there basically at all times, and the reason that Obi didn't play is not because Tibbs hates Obi or thinks Obi sucks. It's because Obi would have to play next to Randall, and Randall is the big fish. And Obi has to play next to Randall if he's going to get 20 plus minutes. And that would leave them without a rim protector. And that just violates what Tibbs believes about basketball. He wants to take away the paint. And he doesn't believe that those guys are going to do that as sufficiently as he wants. And so he reverts to Randall and, and Obi playing fewer minutes. But they got to find a way to play Obi more. Yeah. They, whether it's with, I mean, I don't know. Maybe if you're the front office, you just, you don't have a backup center. And you're like, all right, guess you got to play OB a backup center now. Mm -hmm. Nobody mm -hmm. else to put there. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what you do. Maybe Tib saw these last five games and is just like, you know what? Screw it. OB is, is good enough now to where it just, it more than makes up for what, uh, you know, the, the paint defense is going to lose when him and Randall are out there. Uh, you know, I, I don't I don't know how they yeah. fix it. I also think the one thing I think will happen is I think there is going to be some roster consolidation. Yeah, they have they have. I was going through it this morning. They have they have 13 guys who. If they go into training camp, assuming they're not going to bring back the exact same roster, but just for the sake of hypotheticals, mm -hmm. if they brought back everyone on the roster today and resign Mitchell Robinson. They would have 13 guys going into training camp thinking, okay, I should have a legitimate rotation role and be playing legitimate minutes. And that's just too many. Yeah. It's great to have depth, but you want to have depth of, of, of quality, right. not necessarily right. depth of like, of, of just, you have guys who feel entitled to minutes because they're vets, right? You know, Nerlens Noel is, is something where they can consolidate, uh, Kemba Walker, who I did not include as one of the 13, is still mm -hmm. on the roster next year for $9 million. Mm -hmm. uh, Derek Rose, we don't know what the heck his injury status is going to be. Uh, Alec Burks, another veteran who is who is a helpful, good player, can help a good team as a wing off the bench. Yeah. Um, and and then you got all of the young guys. And and I just wonder if, if they feel like there is a, a good player they can go after. I'm not saying trade all the young guys for... 32 year old on an expiring contract. But if they feel like there is one player they can go after and get 
you know, people always assume the consolidation trade that's coming is you pair Burks and Noel and maybe somebody else and you get 20 some odd million dollars of salary and you can bring in one big salary and you trade out three guys and that helps you in that aspect. But maybe there's another trade that that could be out there that includes pairing like three of the young guys together. Yeah. Maybe if they feel like Obi is is never going to work here. Uh, but hey, there's this great trade with this team that loves Obi and thinks he's great. I'm sure that would infuriate fans. But <laughs> but but that's that's something that like front offices are talking about trades all the time. Yeah. You know, that's that's something where it's like. You, they have a lot of of young players too, and and that's something that that's always on the table when you go into the off season. Also, and uh, you know, if you feel like you're going to go into a season where we have this young guy who we think is really good, but we're just not going to play him, uh, then then maybe the the better value is to see if you can bring in somebody who is just as good, but you will play. Uh, so so I don't. I don't really know the answer to that question. It could be, I just bring that up to say it could be one of one of a million things, but I agree with the sentiment behind it that like they drafted him eighth overall too. Like, what are you going to draft a guy eighth overall and just, just never going to give him an opportunity to play 20 minutes. Just never, even after he shows like pretty good player. Like I just, something should happen and probably will but I don't know which one it's going to be. And like I said, it's, it's been a head scratcher for me, um, especially given the needs that we had at, at other positions that still haven't been filled. And I also feel like, again, you know, from a coaching standpoint, I think Tibbs missed out on opportunities to, yes, he's a guy who likes stability. Yes, he's a guy who likes structure. He sticks to his ways. But I felt like he, he needed to experiment a little bit more, especially during the season when we were looking for he every you know I, I recall several post games where he would say we were looking for energy tonight we were looking for, we were looking for a spark we were looking for intensity tonight and a lot of those guys whether it was OB it was Grimes it, it, it's 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 uh, it's McBride it's quick those guys are on the bench and I just felt like there were times that there was a stretch where we played like three straight games against um, teams that play small it was like Charlotte. The Timberwolves and and another team. I was at I was at a few of those games, and in the fourth quarter, I'm I'm looking and I'm saying like, why not try to go here, Ob Randall? Give yourself a spark. You're playing more athletic teams. You're playing smaller teams. Why not try to go there? And I felt like Tibbs really missed the mark in terms of just seeing what what more of these young guys could do and and you know maybe get us a spark a little bit earlier in the season. Um, one of the guys. When you, when you mention consolidation and, and question marks, especially amongst these kids, is Cam Reddish. You know, again, front office tips, are they, are they on the same page? They bring in Reddish. I'm 100% with the deal. You know, Kevin wasn't going to come back. You, you had a pick swap with Charlotte that, uh, that, a conditional pick with Charlotte that, you know, you, you gave up. You have a lot of picks in, in the war chest. Anyway, I didn't mind it. I look at the kid, an athletic wing, potential quick first step don't have too many of those on this team I look at I look at the the needs at defense at the wing that we don't have I don't feel like we have enough positional versatility a guy that can guard threes and fours but yet the the kid doesn't play and they've got to make a decision on him after next season where where do you where do you think they go with, with Cam Reddish I don't think they know I don't think it'll be an extension because of that right like I, I don't think they they have any idea. I think for the most part, you know, we have a, a small sample of guys who have actually been traded on rookie years, but are on rookie scale contracts, but could still get are good enough to maybe get extensions. And uh, normally, it doesn't happen when they get traded. Like in that second year, Reddish is obviously extension eligible come the off season before the start of next season. Uh, you know, same same way that RJ is, and I I just i don't know i in atlanta they were just so out on him uh the way that he i'm wary of that i'm wary of when an organization who has two and a half years worth of intense up close personal information on a guy and they're so out on him that just makes me wary and you look at him and Atlanta was for like 14 points per hundred possessions 
worse when he was on the floor this year. Uh, and, and you're right about like the defensive potential. He's a long athletic wing mm. and there are moments where he'll look really good. And then there are moments where he'll just gamble like crazy mm-hmm. and some will get a wide open layup. Uh, and, and so I just, the potential is there, but we've heard on Cam Reddish that the potential is there in every one of his stops and the potential hasn't really shown dating right. back to Duke, you know, uh, since AAU. And so I don't think an extension is going to come because he had like a month with the Knicks before he had that season ending injury, a little more than a month with the Knicks before he had the season ending injury. And he wasn't in the rotation for a lot of that. I I just, I thought, man, I had so many people contact me and I had, and I contacted so many people and just engaged them in conversations that they were totally interested in Mm -hmm. after that trade of like, a front office trading a first round pick for a guy who the coach openly didn't want to play. And then they trade for him and he won't play. And just talking about the philosophy of like how an organization can do that. Cause this isn't about Kevin Knox. It's about the first round pick that you right, gave right, up. Right. The justification originally of trading that first round pick when they, they traded it to, to Charlotte, they end up being Kai Jones and, and, and they get Charlotte's future first and, mm-hmm. The justification of making the original trade was that it opens up more flexibility. And now you're kind of trying to figure out what you're going to do with Cam Reddish, who is a guy who basically anyone could have gone out and traded for at right. any point this season. Right. I mean, the Hawks said, we'll do it if you trade us a first round pick. And no one offered him a first round pick. And then the Knicks called and said, OK, we'll give you like a heavily protected first. And the Hawks were just like, OK. Let's do it. Right. Done. Get this done immediately. Uh, that that hastiness makes me a little wary. I don't think an extension is going to come. Uh, I I don't know what he's going to be like next year because we just haven't seen him with the Knicks. But again, if you're the front office, like if Tibbs doesn't want to play the guy, do you say, OK, well, we're going to take away the guys he does want to play? fine if if you are never going to play cam reddish over alec burks which by the way like alec burks in 2022 is a better player than cam reddish yeah Uh, uh, no question Mm -hmm. alec burks in 2022 is a better player than cam reddish if 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 cam reddish is never going to play over alec burks like i I wonder if the front office is being like okay well we got to trade alec burks because we can't have traded a first round pick for cam reddish and then not see what he is and then just let him walk in restricted free agency next year because we don't know what he is or, or, or maybe worse overpay him mm-hmm, in restricted mm-hmm. free agency because we think he's going to be good, but we don't have the solid amount of evidence in front of us to be able to make an educated decision on what we think he's going to be. That said, it's like, I don't know. There were a lot of people who said to me, like, how did I, I think there's a lot of sentiment of like, how is Tibbs not playing him after the front office traded that? Mm-hmm. I think there were just as many people in the league who were like, how is the front office making that trade? If the coach isn't on board, like, you know, that Tibbs believes what he believes. Right. You don't hire Tibbs. If you don't know that he believes what he believes. Right. And if that's the case, then operate that way. Right. You know, like I've heard of other situations like and in other organizations, it's where a, an exec one, I was talking to an exec who wanted to make a deal and uh, the coach didn't want the deal. And so the exec was just like, I guess we're not, we're out then fine. Mm. If you're not going to play him, then what is the point of me doing this? That's fine. And it wasn't a contentious we're out. It was a, we're a team. We got to be on the same page. Yeah. And so I just, there were a lot of people in the league who were like, why is the, what is the front office doing? Like, why are they so apart? Why were they so apart on the campus stuff? Right. Why are they so apart on this? Like that is an organizational imperfection that ideally if you're the Knicks, you want to shore up because you're the best organizations have cohesion from the front office to the coaching staff, to the players, to everybody else. And that's a flaw. 
You hit it on the head, man. They've got to get on the same page. And, and this one w- was just another example of it because it just didn't make much sense. And um, I'm with you 100% on, on being leery to make that trade. And I said that to Knicks fans. And because, like I said, there's a lot of, you know, of our fan base that, you know, want to see this kid in and, and they see the, the tantalizing skill sets and everything like that. But, you know, my thought when, when they first got him was, okay, the Hawks GM and McMillan, oh, you guys are getting the next Paul George. Yet they traded him. He was on the block. I mean, his name came about maybe even from the draft. I believe we were hearing that the Hawks were willing he, to trade. He asked him. out last summer. Right. He and and there were no takers at that point. And to well, me, a lot of people were, were turned off by the fact that, like, you know, part of all this, by the way, is mm. that he asked out because he wanted a bigger role. Right. By the way, he, he, asked, he asked out because he wanted a bigger role. Than what he had in Atlanta when he was playing 23 minutes a game. 23 minutes a night. This year. 23 and minutes. And then he came to the Knicks and sat on the bench. Right. And I wonder, I mean, we're talking about how the Knicks will handle Reddish. I wonder how Reddish will handle the Knicks. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't, I haven't had the opportunity to get to know Cam Reddish. He just, just got to New York. Mm. I, I don't know how he'll handle the Knicks. I don't know how much of him winning in Atlanta was like specific to Atlanta specific to the relationships he had with those people and how much of it was specific to the fact that like he wants to play 30 minutes. He wants to be the guy because I don't see a situation where Cam Reddish is playing 30 minutes a game and being the guy. I don't think there's any way that that happens. Uh, I actually think the most realistic situation is he's playing. he, He has the same roles. He did the best case situation for him is he has the same role he did in Atlanta. Yeah. And I I wonder how he is going to handle the Knicks if that happens. Because the last time he had the role that he had in Atlanta, he requested a trade from Atlanta. Right. So right. I, I I maybe there's there's more um maybe he handles it differently a second time around. Uh or 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 maybe that affects what happens in his in his free agency next summer. Yeah, I just you know, look, he, he can certainly fulfill his potential. Maybe it's here, maybe it's elsewhere. I, I just felt like, you know, uh, a team will move heaven and earth to keep a guy if they if they're really motivated to, and and the way that Atlanta was just so ready to uh, you know acquiesce to his his trade demands, I think it's 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 you know gives you a little bit reason for caution. So we'll we'll see what happens there. Um, another decision, Mitchell Robinson. What, what what is the gun to your head? Is Mitchell Robinson a Nick next season? I would say more likely than not, yes. Um, I, I, I think it I think it makes sense uh, just because I think he's gonna get like 10 to 13 million a year like something mm-hmm. in the range mm-hmm. of the extension that he's eligible for that's kind of like the go-to contracts mm-hmm. for bigs of his ilk and right. then once they sign the contract they go in one direction or the other you know mm-hmm. like Daniel Gafford got three for 40 mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Robert Williams got like four for 48 yeah. And then Robert Williams ratcheted up to becoming an all defense caliber player this right. year. I right. would have had Robert Williams on my all defense no question. team this year. And mm-hmm. that, that, that contract now looks like a wonderful contract. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it can, it can kind of go either way. Uh, Wendell Carter got a similar one. I think he got four for 50. So, so I, I, I think he will, it's most likely he ends up in there. Uh, a lot of the teams that would want him, uh, you know, I think, I think Detroit is a place where he could make sense uh, from both a basketball fit and a age fit. uh, And they could sign him with cap space, but a lot of the places where he makes sense, he would, it would have to be like, he'd have to take the mid-level exception, which is possible. The mid-level exception is going to be 10 million. Mm. So maybe, maybe that's just, he gets the bottom of his range and that will open up at least a bunch of destinations for him. Uh, Maybe I should have said 50, 50 on this because I'm really more 50, 50, Mm -hmm. uh, and and the problem with sign in trades with him is there's this niche CBA concept mm-hmm. called base year compensation, mm-hmm. which basically makes guys getting big raises on their previous salary salaries really difficult to sign and trade. Mm-hmm. And he is gonna be um, subject to base year compensation. So like if someone like Charlotte, for example, who really needs rim protection, really needs a center, and I think he could fit really nicely in Charlotte, wants to do that a sign and trade they would have to sign and trade for him but that that could be that could be difficult dallas needs a center yeah they would have to sign and trade for him that could be difficult uh so so i uh 
I'm kind of 50 50 on it, uh, mostly because of the roster fit stuff that I talked about. Like, if you're going to have Julius Randle, if you're going to have RJ too, who wants to get to the rim all the time, Mitch hangs around the basket Mm -hmm. more than any player in the NBA. Like, I don't mean that as hyperbole. His average shot this year was one foot from the rim, two and a half times closer than the second closest average shot guy Mm -hmm. in Clint Capella was two and a half feet from the rim. So it's like Mitch hangs around the rim more than any player in the league. And he's a good player and he's a great offensive rebounder. And his best trait is that he does the things he's good at and the things he's not good at, he never touches. And that is a great trait to have in a player, just a dude who knows his role and does the things he's good at. And he's getting better at the things he's good at. He is a good player, uh, but, but he also needs to fit specifically well and randall needs someone who fits specifically well and rj needs someone who fits specifically well and it's hard moving forward it's hard to move forward with three guys who need to be inside the three-point line like that's another part of like you want to have a top half of the league offense not many top half of the league offenses have three guys who need to be inside the three-point line in their starting lineup no, no question. And yeah, it was, uh, I think it was Macri I was speaking to who mentioned that base year compensation that could be a little hiccup in, in any terms of um, sign and trade offers. Um, point guard situation. Obviously, it's a need. We're seeing Jalen Brunson stock going through the roof. The price is going up game after game after game as he continues to shred a Utah perimeter defense that's just completely non-existent. Papa Brunson saying he's not going to come cheap. Uh, an ESPN article just came out and said, could be anywhere between 20 to $25 million a year for Jalen Brunson. And they're saying Dallas is not entertaining sign and trade talks. Uh, you're hearing Brockton could be available for the Pacers. You have the Sextons out there. Uh, gun to your head. What, what, do you, what do you think the Knicks go in the offseason? I mean, everything you hear, you think they want Brunson. I mean, they, they could get Brunson without a sign and trade. Right. It's possible. Everyone talks about the sign and trade stuff. Brunson, by the way, is another guy who would be subject to base year compensation. Mm. And and he would be a lot more complicated base year compensation than Mitch because mm. the the way it works is is the incoming salary is the new salary in the trade, but the outgoing salary is is fifty percent of the new salary. Mm. And so it makes it really difficult for salary matching. And because of that, the larger the new salary is, the more difficult it is to sign and trade the guy with base year compensation. Right, right because that disparity of matching money becomes really difficult. Mm. So, so he is more difficult to trade on base year compensation, not impossible, have him Lonzo ball, mm. uh, but it just, it's just more complicated. But the other way to work around it is uh, the Knicks are going to have a little more cap room, I think, than initially expected. Um, you know, the cap cap went up a little mm. more than its original projections. They could, if they renounce everybody and, and, and get down under the cap, they, they could get a few million dollars under the salary cap uh and then they could they could try to dump a couple of guys they could like wave and stretch kemba walker i i I think you know i've i've gone through it i'll write something on it at some point but Mm -hmm. there are ways they could get creative and and open up about 20 million dollars in cap room that are not like i shouldn't even say get creative because they're Mm -hmm. not like crazy cap gymnastics to pull off like i think they could get about 20 million in cap room that might be enough for brunson Mm -hmm. And then, and then maybe if the Knicks lay out their plan to Dallas, I mean, uh, that, that ESPN story from Tim McMahon, I think they, they mentioned that, uh, he mentioned that Dallas would not, uh, want to participate right. in sign and trades, yeah. but if the Knicks go to Dallas and they say, okay, we've got this preliminary deal worked out in which they're taking on Alec Burks in a second round pick, and we're not taking back any more salary. Uh, we're going to wave and stretch Kemba Walker. So that his cap number for next season is going to be three million instead of nine million, and now we've got twenty million dollars of cap room. Uh, oh, and we're able to to trade Nerlens Noel, and we're bringing back six million in salary. So now we got like twenty three million, twenty two million in cap room, and we're giving it all to Brunson. We can do all of those things and pull off those trades and just sign Brunson, or you guys can do the sign and trade, and get something back for him. Yeah. What do you want? I mean, what's Dallas going to do? They have to. Yeah. Why would you, why would you say no? In that right, situation? right. You, gotta, you, you, you can choose to lose that negotiation or you can lose in the big picture and not get back something decent for Jalen Brunson, who's a yeah. good player. So, so I, I think there are, there are numerous different ways that Brunson could, could end up on the Knicks. And there aren't that many 
guys who you could sign this summer who you're like, that is a starting point guard. I really like Malcolm Brogdon, but, yeah, me too. but that would be a trade. Yeah. Uh, and I think he's on a reasonable salary, yeah. and he, he's got an injury history. Just the in, yeah, the injury just scared me with him, man. Yeah. I think he'd be great for this team, but I think the injuries are tough, tough to get past. Yeah, that's reasonable. Uh, but he's 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 a, he's a very good player, and and certainly a, a very reliable starting point guard. Uh, and I think Brunson is 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 probably about a similar caliber mm-hmm. player, and I think he's probably going to get about a similar amount of money to what uh, to what Brogdon's at. You look at the other guys. It's like, look, I love Tyus Jones as a backup point guard. Yeah, he's he's one of the best backup point guards in the league. But I don't think you can walk in and if he's your starter on day one, it's like I don't think you're feeling amazing about that. He's reliable and he can shoot, and you he's a he's a solid defender, and he never turns the ball over mm-hmm. ever. Mm-hmm. Like he's the best low turnover point guard in the entire league. But you know, I don't think he's he's your starting. He can be your spot starter. John Morant get hurt, he comes in, they go mm-hmm. twenty and five without job. But I don't think I don't think he's your starting point guard and and he's really kind of the next guy in line on the open market. Uh, you know, I don't think Sexton is a point guard at all. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so so I think he's more of a more of a scoring guard, mm-hmm. more of an off guard. Uh so so you know, I think I think it's kind of Brunson is the guy to go for, or or you you look at trades. It could be Brogdon, it could be somebody else. Yeah, I think they'll have to look into it. You know, a lot of the fan base will say, just just go it quickly. You know, this Brunson thing is fool's gold. There's going to be too much money, this, that, and the third. But, look, I, I something just tells me I don't think this organization views quickly in that role just yet. You know, maybe that changes down the road. But Is I don't... that thing that tells you that, that they don't use him in that role? Yeah, <laughs> that's just a fact. I mean, if we're going Alec Burks for all, you know, the, the entire season, he's finishing the season. That's his starting point. Um, that you know, it just I'm just not sure if they if they want quickly in that role. And again, I didn't mind quickly as that dynamo off the bench closing games because you know he, he did have that role quite consistently. The Brunson thing to me is intriguing, man. I just feel like yes, people have issues with the size, the defensive concerns, but the, the, the way this guy attacks the basket is finishing so efficiently around the basket finishing so well off of his drives i mean he's anti everything that we have on this team we don't have anyone near close to to where he's finishing as efficiently as he is this year and look I, you know I, I think yes the playoffs fool's gold it's something to be leery about uh, i just think this kid i think he would be a safe pickup for us and we got to address the position yeah, I, he's he's a good player. I was uh, I put him third on my six man of the year ballot mm. last year when mm-hmm. I had a vote. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he was great for Dallas off the bench and highly efficient, highly efficient scorer. Good at getting to the paint. Good inside the three point arc. He's he's a really good player. I I would hope mm-hmm. if I were a Knicks fan that if the Knicks sign him, that that's the reason they sign him. You know, you hear all this stuff and and sometimes it's hard to delineate when people write about it if uh the stuff about their personal connections the family to ties and CAA and exactly yeah, if yeah. if that's just people bringing color and narrative to the story yeah. or if that's really a reason they're hearing the next one Tim and it's like just because Rick Brunson was an assistant for Tibbs or because Rick Brunson was he played uh, for the Knicks. Was, exactly. <laughs> or because Rick Brunson was was Leon Rose's first client. Right, right. Like, just because they have those connections, that's not a reason not legit, man. to sign. That should have literally nothing to do yeah. with the thought process. And, you know, you've you've seen them operate and like they Leon Rose brings in the CAA guys. Like mm-hmm. you've seen them operate in that way. And that should have absolutely nothing to do with who becomes right. your starting point guard. Like you don't, you don't keep your starting point guard in the family. You bring in the best starting point guard. And it just so happens that amongst free agents this year, Jalen Brunson is the best starting point guard. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not saying if you get Jalen Brunson on a good deal, that's, that's great. I would just hope that, that, that I don't, I, I wouldn't even hope that the personal connections are low on the list. Mm-hmm. I would I would want the personal connections to be not on the list at all. I just that is not a reason to sign anyone. Well, last question: Will the Knicks uh, give RJ Barrett the rookie max extension this year, and and what do you think he gets? 
No, I don't think they will. Uh, you look at the guys who have signed max extensions, mm-hmm. and they're all, they're not guys who could be all stars one day. Mm-hmm. They're not guys who some people think are totally all stars already, but other people think aren't. Mm-hmm. They're like guys who are already all stars. You know, it's mm-hmm. Luca, it's Trey Young, it's, it's, it's not guys who could get there one day. Mm-hmm. The way that the extensions work, even if, even if the player thinks that he is worth the max, the way the extensions work, unless it's just like a guy who's just a total guarantee, like like Luca, where it's like Luca comes in mm. and he's an all NBA player right away. When John Morant goes in for his extension negotiation next year, mm. he's gonna be like I or he's gonna be like I am I am an all NBA player right now. Mm. Give me the max. And they're gonna say, Okay. Uh with RJ, what you do is even if he says, I believe I'm a max guy, the Knicks are going to say they're going to want to compromise. They're going to say, okay, you want the long-term stability of knowing that you have this money guaranteed. Uh, Give us the compromise of paying you a little less. And that's how those negotiations tend to go. Um, I I think if I'm the Knicks and RJ says to me, I think I'm worth the max. If I'm the Knicks, I'm going to say, that he hasn't had a season with league average efficiency yet. No, or really, no, not at really all. close to it. And you can't give a guy a max if he's never had a league average efficiency. You just can't. And I'm someone who thinks RJ has all star potential. Yeah. Uh, and and you, but you you can't do that. Um, I wonder because of RJ's potential and because of RJ's kind of standing and where people think he can go. I wonder if there is an extension reached. Uh, mm. Also, because the Knicks would like to have cap space in 2023, which is another part of it. And RJ's cap hold in 2023 is going to be much cheaper than a max extension number that's already on the books. Uh, that was something that, like the Wizards with Bradley Beal, when the Wizards <laughs> wanted to have money in 2016 free agency, Bradley Beal, same situation. Bradley Beal, uh, you know, hadn't been an all star yet, was looking like he could be one day, and obviously he ended up getting there. Uh, They didn't come to an extension agreement, but also because the Wizards wanted money in 2016, and Beal's cap hold off of his rookie salary was going to be much less than a max number for him. So that's something that comes into the equation too. So I wonder if they reach an extension agreement, and I don't think it's the biggest deal if they don't because he's restricted next year. He has repeated time and time again he wants to be back. If I'm the Knicks, I think you could just tell him, okay, you you believe you're the max, you come out, you play like a max guy, mm-hmm. you will get the max. You won't have to sign an offer sheet. You'll get the max. Uh, but even from a cap flexibility standpoint, I think it's uh, it's viable that he doesn't get there. If he does extend, I imagine it would be like on on a cheaper number because his max is five for 180. 180, or yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I I think if he if he extends, it's going to be something much cheaper than that. Maybe like the like the John Collins deal or something mm-hmm. like that mm-hmm. five for one twenty five, mm-hmm. um, but I'm just making that up. I got I got a I got a story that'll come out either later this week or next week actually where I'm I, I'm going to talk to more people around the league and kind of come up with a better answer to this question yeah. than the one I'm giving right now. But that all factors in. Yeah, I'm with you. I think for you know from a cap flexibility standpoint, I think it would be worth their while to wait. Um, see if some of these existing contracts that they have, they're not able to find trades for them in this offseason, see if they come off the books, get some more free agents under that cap, and then and then sign RJ to that deal. And I'm with you. I think, no, would I give him the 5180? No. Uh, I certainly loved his progression again from year two to three. I think he's emerged uh, not just on the court, but also you know as a leader, which is very important, especially in this town. When we're seeing what's happening with Julius Randle, I think R.J. Barrett is really uh, trying to assume that role. You talk about the 12 games of 30 plus points, you know, really jumping in and trying to be that guy for this team. Um, some outstanding games, the Laker game, you know, the 46 points against the Heat, the buzzer beat against the Celtics. Thought R.J. had a, a solid year. The free throw attempts going up, being very aggressive when the offense is running through him. You know, very, very electric out of that pistol set. Want to see him finishing more, and I think that adds to you know the efficiency points that you are making, uh, especially being more efficient off of his pull-ups. And that's something that he and Drew Hanlon have said they want to work on. He wants to work with DeMar DeRozan this offseason. Hopefully, you know, we get some magic there uh, because he's, I think he only shot like 33% off his pull-ups again this year. And 
that's going to be very important for me for his progression into year four because, you know, look, um, he certainly made his way to the basket and, and got there at will. And sometimes he's finishing with both hands and, and looking quite good at it, but that's not always going to be there. And he's still trying to get that intermediate jumper going and he just hasn't been able to get it just yet so hopefully that that's something that uh that he can get in year four and you know i, I look at the the porter jr deal i was at 145 i think he got up to 172 with incentives and a team in denver kind of investing in the potential right not necessarily what the guy is right now but investing in the potential that this guy can uh get there improve his game and, and maybe even be an all-star I think that's fair. I think I think a little more context to the Porter deal, though, mm. is I think having the first guy in the door is different than having the second or third. Mm. Like, they know R- R- no matter what that Porter deal ends up being when they give it out, they've got Jokic and they've mm. got Murray. Mm. And they know those guys are, those guys are, you know, Jokic is an MVP and, and Murray is a, is a damn good player. I mean, he is awesome and yeah. has showed up in post seasons and the, that core has won too. It's not, it's not projected winning. Like that core has, has won. They've won a lot of games when they've been healthy. Uh, and, and so when they give that out, it's like, we've got our two guys. Porter is the third. We're keeping this thing together. And they got Aaron Gordon to add, to add into it as well. So, so I think that's a little different than, okay, we're going to max out our first guy. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and a, and a 25% max, I, I don't like that we just refer to everything as a max contract because yeah. it's the maximum they're allowed to offer him. But like RJ's max isn't the same as LeBron's max because he hasn't been in the league as long. Right. Like RJ's max is 25% of the cap. Here starts at 25% of the cap compared to LeBron's, which starts at 35% of the cap. Mm. So it's it's not it's not this giant, massive veteran super max that 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 we talk about all the time. But but that being said, like it's a lot of money to give one guy to be your first guy in the door. And I just, I don't see the Knicks necessarily rushing to do that when I don't think they have to. Yeah. Like right, I right. think you can get him for a lesser number than $36 million a year. Well, no question, man. This team has a lot of work to do, but Fred, like I said, you did a great, great job in your first year. Hopefully as the off season progresses, we get through the draft, get through free agency, you come back. We'll talk with the fans a little bit and, uh, and see how next season looks, man. But thanks again for your time. And once again, great job this season covering the team. Thank you for having me, man. I really appreciate it.